Well, good morning, Mo. Uh, I'm just looking over here and I am very hopeful that you have your brand new different uh, model uh, Ortho Joe uh, coffee cup, the plastic model, which is better for commuters. Wow. Have you know, seen yours yet? Well, if you're telling me it's this one, I do have it. I do have it. Yes. <laughs> and I must say it is pretty, it's pretty slick. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to use it for everything. Yeah, it's not just little, for coffee. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's good. Yeah, the, the button on top and it's, it's all good. Mm. So we do need our coffee. So, um, so this is uh, one of our sessions where we just have kind of been looking at what we've been publishing and it's something that caught our eye. And again, we would invite uh, our listeners and viewers to, let us know if there's topics you'd like us to address. Just uh, email us at uh, orthojo at jbgs.org and we'll, we will uh, uh, put something on the list uh, or correspond with you. Uh, we're also open to any critiques of something we've said or you disagree with or you think we could have done better. We always like uh, feedback. But what uh, caught my eye in the uh, most recent publications at the journal uh, is this uh, manuscript out of uh, Spain. It's a rather straightforward trial on how long does a patient with a proximal humerus fracture need to be in a sling. And they, uh, they did, a, a, I think, a really sound design. 143 patients randomized, uh, of course, the majority being females. This is primarily a, a, a bone density related issue. But they followed up the patients with standard uh, validated functional outcome measures and uh, visual analog scale, et cetera. And they basically have, have identified the fact that, that patients really only need a week in a sling versus uh, what you know, I certainly have used as a, as a three week thing in a sling. <clears throat> and uh, well, I don't find the, uh, uh, the findings to be, well, certainly they're clinically impactful. I'm, go I'm gonna change the way I advise patients based on this, it's a really well done trial. Uh, but what, what it got me to thinking is, is really how, how we have a big void in our post-surgical, post-injury rehabilitation strategy, how there's not much evidence. And I know you at uh, Ortho Evidence has really, have really functioned on uh, some rehabilitation studies and, and trying to enhance that. So t tell me what's going on at OE with, uh, yeah. with, your, with your work on rehabilitation yeah. strategies. Yeah, and maybe I'll start off too, Mark, by saying, you know, uh, it's great to see that we're seeing more um, clinical trials in the area um, that is sort of the perioperative area, whether it's even preoperative or postoperative. I'll tell you one thing, when we had, um, it would have been late last year when we, we were doing sort of this, um, what we're calling the OE World Tour, we're, we're getting various right. speakers to speak on various topics over a short period of time. And I'll never forget Cecilia Rogmark, who I know is known to both of us um, in Sweden, and she had made uh, what at that time seemed provocative, but quite frankly, it's not. She said she didn't see value in more implant-related A versus B randomized trials because the solution in this particular case for hip fractures, but you can make the argument for distal radius, you can make the argument certainly for proximal humerus, that the solutions are likely non-operative. The solutions going forward for real advances are likely going to ma be made in you know, preoperative selection uh, it's, and also how we treat the patients in that first 24 hours, 48 hours, first week and first few months with a real focus on strategies for pathways after surgery, which gets me back exactly to this, right? Um, on OE, for example, we have a very robust community of um, uh, you know, uh, physiotherapists as part of that community. And that's, I think, really valuable to us in that context, because we're starting to be able to understand sort of you know, cross-sharing evidence. So we, we put up evidence that's related to you know, some of the uh, post-operative regimes, and you can really see um, you know, the impact that we're making. If you look just even at, um, and, I'll, and I'm I'm varying a little bit off of proximal humerus, but the same concept here applies. If you look at all the trials we've done on, uh, you know, implant A versus implant B for hip fractures, you and I have done lots over the last uh, decade or so. And then you look at a study that says, if you can just get patients to the operating room quicker, you can save lives, right? And so there are, and then you can see, imagine that having a global impact almost immediately. 
Uh, when we think about, let's say, HIP attack is one of those trials, which was right. looking at rapid access to, um, you know, procedure. So do what you do, like do whatever procedure you're going to do, but let's think of other non-surgical modalities uh, that would help patients. So absolutely, I think the next big wave uh, of outcomes is going to be how we monitor patients after surgery and how yeah. we optimize treatments after surgery. Right. When you look at what we have uh, solid evidence on, I think we've got really good evidence in arthroplasty on questions like the, the CPM provide value, uh, the whole issue of prehabilitation for patients right. with hip and knee. Um, we've got some pretty solid evidence, but boy, there's a lot of areas where we just don't know. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, a, it's a, an issue both in, in post-trauma, -tra uh, non-surgical and surgically treated patients, as well as surgically treated patients. I think we have some recent pretty good evidence on the fact that you don't need to limit weight bearing for ankle fracture patients uh, and a big trial going on with the metric consortium, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but boy, there's, 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 there's lots of uh, areas where we could, we could do better. Um, one thing it just crossed my mind was how long do you need to immobilize a patient with an olecranon fracture? Uh, you know, we, we tend to put them in splints and stuff, and I'm not sure that's at all necessary. But I think there's a whole uh, potential huge field of where we could collaborate and make better evidence-based recommendations working with our physiotherapists. And one thing you brought up about your uh, work with the physiotherapy community at OE, we have had the same experience at JBJS. Some of our webinars, we've had six, seven, eight hundred uh, therapists uh, on the line uh, looking at uh, topics of mutual interest. And gets to my uh, one of my things is that I think the old bit about departments uh, yeah. and and uh, certifications are, are are really nothing of more use other than the certification, but where, where we should really be collaborating is on teams, you know, phys physical therapists, occupational therapists, orthopedic surgeons, physiatrists, we're all interested in musculoskeletal problems and we should be working increasingly in teams to improve the outcomes of our, of our patients. Um, and I'm glad you're doing it at OE. We're, we're very much trying to uh, integrate uh, physiotherapists uh, and occupational therapists uh, at the journal. Well, you know, I mean, like you have to imagine, right, that if you're working and I'll, I'll use the word siloed, right, you know, if we're just thinking of subspecialty silos, you know, you're not going to be able to problem solve in the same way. I mean, when you look at, you know, we look across all sort of research in the area of teams and interdisciplinary teams, the more diversity you have of thought and ideas and the more diversity of people you have on a team, the more likely you are to have better solutions to the problems you have. So you know, it's not, it doesn't go without saying that when you think about distal radius, proximal humerus, hip fractures, all these fractures being, you know, look at, look at the decades of research in orthopedics. And you know, when if you ask someone, you know, what do you do with the distal radius fracture? What do you do with the proximal humerus? They still say we need more evidence, right? Or the right. trials will still say, you know, it's not quite resolved. Right. Uh, um, maybe we should be doing much more interdisciplinary work. And I suspect if we were to talk to our physiotherapy colleagues who see treatment A versus B versus C say, well, listen, our goal is if you, you know, if you achieve a certain degree of alignment period, the rest of it isn't the implant. It's all about what we do after that. And we have solutions that we should be testing in your trials, you know, as right. secondary, if not primary outcomes. And similarly, you know, our physiotherapy colleagues and our rehab colleagues, you know, um, would be, you know, in great, great, um, great opportunities for them, right, to engage uh, surgeons. And so we got to find a common place for everyone to talk, you know, kind of like, you know, the concept in a desert evidence is the oasis. Well, the assumption is, you know, just the lions and tigers come to the oasis. No, everyone comes to the oasis, right? Everyone's feeding and trying to get that evidence. So why don't we all kind of work together in whatever that oasis of uh, evidence is? The other thing I would say too, Mark, is we often make the argument, you and I always, is that, you know, the randomized clinical trial is the ruler of this evidence jungle. But sometimes I would think, and I've learned a lot from some of the um, individuals, at least at McMaster, like PJ Devereaux, who said, you know, sometimes you have to really understand the problem. And maybe we do need very large, well-designed observational studies to really pinpoint why something is failing and what are the potential factors that we may or may not be able to influence. So those are also really 
um, important studies that I think we should be always looking at. Right. And of course, those observational trials will be much more effective if we have the different perspectives of the different disciplines interested in the musculoskeletal system and its problems. Oh, so, for sure. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think both of our organizations have made progress in integrating uh, teams in it as far as yeah. our research world and publication world. And we certainly have experience uh, in, in, in designing uh, trials uh, with collaboration across disciplines. But boy, I think we need to do a whole lot more of it because the different perspectives, that, as you point out, really bring up essential factors that because of our you know, sort of somewhat limited horizon as surgeons, we, we often miss. Um, and then, of course, the whole issue about appropriate patient se selection based on their personality characteristics and their, uh, you know, their, their pain interpretation, et cetera. That's, that's a, another thing that our colleagues in different disciplines have, have much more to offer than, than, than us. So, well, we've got some, some foothold in the rehab research world at OE and at JVGS, and we need to keep working on it. And we'll, we'll keep drinking coffee so we can keep working on it. I'm in. Okay. I'm in. I'm in. Cheers. Have a good day. You too.